In this lesson, we're starting off with inheritance and we're looking at autosomal dominant and recessive type of inheritance. So really only covering off this point here. All right, heredity studies inheritance. So it's how characteristics and traits are transmitted from one generation to another. Now, prior to scientists having any knowledge of DNA or genes, the understanding of the nature of inheritance is pretty shoddy, to be honest. Aristotle and Hippocrates had theories that dated all the way back to 300 or so BC. Darwin came along with his theories later on. Plenty of scientists at the time did as well. So there was even this idea called preformationism. Um, even Pythagoras threw his two cents into this one. Um, and it had the idea that organisms actually develop from miniature versions of themselves so instead of actually assembling from smaller parts it was believed that the complete form of the living thing existed prior to development so everything needed to form an entire human was found in the sperm cell. Now once uh, more scientists started to learn about embryology and genetics and gametes and all those kinds of things these ideas were thrown out. Then along came Gregor Mendel, and he's sometimes referred to as the father of genetics. He was an Austrian monk. He's famous for his experiments on pea plants, uh, but he was also multi-talented and studied many facets of science. So initially he started working with mice. It didn't go down so well in the monastery with the bishop, so he switched to plants. And his main work is looking at pea plants. Now, most of Mendel's work, particularly with peas, has become the foundation for what we know of inheritance today. Mendel crossbred pea plants to model and deduce the basic principles of how physical traits are inherited. So he studied uh, seven different traits of the pea plant, the seed shape, the seed color, the flower color, the pod shape, the pod color, the flower position, and the stem height. Now he observed that, say, the purple flower appeared more often than the white flower, that the green seed pod was more abundant than the yellow pod, that round seeds appeared more often than the wrinkled seeds, as well as so many other things. So really importantly, though, he saw patterns. He saw that some traits increased in abundance throughout the generations, others disappeared, but then appeared again later on in further generations. So from this, he made some inferences and, you know, he inferred that traits must be determined by some heritable unit passed on unchanged from parent to offspring. So we now know these as genes. He said that individuals inherit one of these units from each parent and that they have these two units actually unite. Traits may not be physically appearing, but they can still actually be present. And the units come in different varieties, which we now know as alleles. Now, without knowing at the time, but what he was studying was single autosomal gene inheritance. So he looked at traits which only required one gene on chromosomes that were not sex chromosomes, and they were being passed from generation to generation. So it's a really simple mode of inheritance, which has been built on quite a lot since, but it was a really good start. So Mendel's work was published in a really obscure science journal, and it wasn't really noticed in the scientific community, and then he died. Um, it was rediscovered about 20 years after his death, and importantly, it was reproduced, right? It was other scientists had a go, and they found it to be quite reliable. So the repeatability and reliability is sometimes questioned, like they thought, oh my gosh, is this all too good to be true? But, you know, did he doctor the results? It's actually found to be quite reproducible, so go science. Mendel crossbred peas to follow certain traits through subsequent generations, and a monohybrid cross allows one trait which results from a single gene locus and can observe all of the respective alleles, all the varieties. So the parental generation is known as the pea, so this one is the pea generation there, and everything else are the filial generations of offspring afterwards. So in a monohybrid cross, the numbers and the ratio of each variety, the trait appearing in each generation depends on the type of gene being followed. In the case of the single autosomal genes that he's looking at, they were showing dominant and recessive traits. And the dominant trait being the one that appears more frequently, while the recessive is less common. Now, dominant and recessive traits use specific conventions to be communicated. So the dominant trait uses uppercase letters. The recessive trait are represented using lowercase letters. And an individual um, can inherit both combinations. Those that have inherited two identical varieties are known as homozygous for a trait, whereas those with a combination are known as heterozygous for this trait. So homozygous and heterozygous individuals with at least one dominant allele will express the dominant phenotype knowing that this is the combination of genes and this is what is physically represented. So homozygous recessive individuals down here only have two recessive alleles and they will only express this recessive phenotype. 
Now, Punnett squares are a way to organise and predict the next generation of offspring's genotypes and therefore phenotypes in a genetic cross. So the gametes that each parent have available are considered, and knowing that the law of segregation will lead to a random assortment um, of which way the maternal and paternal alleles are going to be sorted, and then all the combinations that will happen at fertilisation are also going to need to be considered. So we have all the different ones, and we can look at it in the sense of sperms and eggs, but, you know, in this case, for plants, it's not really relevant. Now, in a true breeding or a pure breeding genetic cross, two homozygous organisms are crossed, uh, and all offspring will show the same genotype and phenotype, right? 100% of the offspring will be heterozygous and display the dominant phenotype because they have that one dominant allele. If these heterozygous offspring were then crossed again, it's found that the dominant trait often appears in a ratio of three to one. So three of these will show the dominant phenotype, whereas this one is showing the recessive phenotype. So that recessive phenotype is being quietly passed from generation to generation, even though it didn't appear in the previous generation. Now, the outcomes of the offspring can be communicated communicated using genotype and phenotype percentages or as a ratio. They can also be represented using histograms. So it's really easy to do uh, when looking at autosomal dominant and recessive traits. There's only two here, um, but it's going to become a lot more complex later on with different types of inheritance. Now, some examples of single autosomal gene inheritance traits include guinea pigs. Uh, their, their coat color, their fur length and their texture is uh, inherited in this manner. And there's a lot of different human body features that we will investigate further in class that are um, inherited this way. Some disorders, excuse me, <clears throat> can be inherited this way. So disorders which are inherited in an autosomal dominant way include Huntington's disease, uh, phenyl phenylketonuria and Marfan syndrome, whereas cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, which we've talked about in reference to single nucleotide mutations occurring, they are autosomal and recessive. So an individual must inherit two copies of the gene in order to show the phenotype related to these diseases. So we've got a lot more to cover, but this is looking at autosomal dominant inheritance.